I'll start by welcoming everybody who's joined us so far. Um, thank you so much for, for joining us for this nutshell. Tom's going to be talking about profitable tree crops in just a few minutes. And I wanted to introduce what Savannah Institute is, for those of you who don't already know. We're a nonprofit organization. We're really focused on research and education about agroforestry. So agroforestry, if you don't know already, are just basically trees that produce crops that help farmers in, in other kinds of ways. And it can look like a bunch of different things. And we can, we can get into that um, after uh, the talk if you want to. Um, but a lot of our work is doing research and cooperation with farmers, um, farmers like Tom, and, and really connecting farmers to scientists and universities and other organizations as well. So we host um, a bunch of events during the year, including our perennial farmer gathering, which is really about networking and bringing these ideas together and getting, getting farmers the ability to, to talk to each other about what works and what um, maybe didn't work so well. Um, and ideas to try out for, for next year. We also develop educational resources, like, like the ones that we are participating in tonight. So I, again, want to thank everybody for coming. I'm excited to hear what Tom has to say. So Tom is of Redfern Farm, and he has um, lots of experience, and he is a really great supporter of Savannah Institute. And I'm, I'm, I'm really excited. I'm new to agroforestry. I'm new to Savannah Institute. Um, so I, for one, am really excited to hear what Tom has to say. So Tom, I'll let you introduce yourself or, or go ahead and get started. Okay, I'm Tom Wall. I'm co-owner of Redfern Farm, which has been in existence for a little over 30 years now. And I'm going to talk about high-value tree crops, tree crops that are profitable and some that aren't. Uh, the first one on my list is... Uh, Heart nut. A heart nut is a kind of walnut. Almost all of them are Japanese walnuts. Um, there are a few uh, heart nuts that, that are hybrids with other species, including Manchurian and American butternut, uh, but they're predominantly Japanese walnut. The heart nuts can vary dramatically in shape and size, and internal shell structure is really important. Uh, the kind we like are the ones that will crack in half like in the picture and release the kernel in one whole unbroken piece. Some heart nuts hang on to the kernel pretty hard and the kernel tends to break. The one on the left is a, shows good internal shell structure that releases the kernel easily. The one on the right shows one that binds the kernel tightly in the shell and doesn't release it and is an undesirable nut type. Here are some butternuts, American butternuts, and I show those because I don't have pictures of wild type Japanese walnuts, but most wild-type Japanese walnuts rather resemble American butternuts. The heart nut is a, a genetic mutation of the Japanese walnut that makes this heart-shaped nut. They're fairly easy to grow, but they do have some problems, uh, including walnut bunch disease, uh, which causes witch's broom-type growth and can be lethal to the tree. Uh, in contrast, uh, here's what a healthy young Japanese walnut looks like, and then a, a diseased one. <clears throat> um, we found out recently that the bunch disease problem is closely related to zinc deficiency in the soil. So you can treat either the, the leaves of the heart nut tree to get rid of the disease quickly or treat the soil with zinc sulfate uh, to permanently get rid of the disease problem. Heart nuts tend to be heavy bearing trees, Trees under 10 years old have been known to produce over 100 pounds of nuts. There isn't a really huge world market for heart nuts, but uh, uh, people who do have them for sale uh, usually have no trouble selling them. I get $6 a pound for heart nuts, either in shell or out. So I can, I can sell heart nuts with kernel inside for $6 a pound, or I can crack them open, eat the kernels, and then sell the empty shells for $6 a pound to craft people. So there's actually two products with the heart nut. There's the kernel and the empty shell. The heart nut kernel kind of resembles a Persian walnut or what Americans call an English walnut, except uh, they're actually sweeter and don't have a bitter aftertaste like many of the so-called English walnuts have. But that's all I'm going to say about heart nuts. 
unless there are questions later on. Next tree on my list is persimmons, specifically American persimmon. American persimmons from the northern part of the range are fully cold hardy in zone 5B. The most cold hardy persimmons will survive well into zone 5A. There have even been some reports of American persimmons as far north as southern zone 4B. American persimmon is a native fruit native to the Midwest from Iowa eastward and southward. It's a small fruit compared to the persimmons you would find in the grocery store. The largest ones get up to maybe about three inches diameter maximum. In the wild, they're usually under one inch in size. A persimmon is one of the sweetest fruits in the world. In fact, uh, only Persian dates are sweeter than American persimmons. And that probably has inspired their uh, scientific name, Diosporus, which means food for the gods. Uh, most don't know much about persimmons, uh, except that they're very astringent when they're not ripe. Uh, but people who do know them uh, tend to love them a lot. Um, in fact, persimmon is probably the single most popular fruit tree on Earth, way more popular than apples worldwide. In the north, persimmons are almost unknown, but in the south, southern United States, southeast United States, uh, uh, persimmons are fairly well known, and they, there's a, a, a long history of making what's called persimmon pudding, which is kind of like a banana bread or pumpkin bread but made with persimmons and is very popular. And right now, at this moment, there are more than 25 companies in the state of Indiana that sell persimmon pulp, mostly for making persimmon pudding. They can sell anywhere from about $3 per pound or per pint up to $12 or even $14 per pound or pint. And persimmons are very heavily productive. There's one single persimmon tree in Wapalo, Iowa, that produces about 5,000 pounds of fruit per year, every year, without fail. And it's a, it's a moderate-sized tree. It's maybe 35 feet tall and maybe 12 inches in diameter. Persimmon is the single most reliable crop tree I have ever seen. I've never seen a crop failure on persimmons in more than 30 years of observation. Uh, even when acorns and walnuts and hickories and mulberries and apples and all fail, persimmons will produce a normal crop of fruit. And that's all I'm going to say about persimmons for now. The next tree on my list is pawpaw. Pawpaw is another Native American fruit, native to Iowa and native to points south and east of Iowa. Um, they're native along the Mississippi River as far north as northeast Iowa and also in southwest Iowa along the Missouri River. Pawpaw is the largest fruit native to North America. Uh, the largest fruits can weigh over a pound. Pawpaw is the only temperate member of a whole family of tropical fruits, and the pawpaw fruit does have a very tropical taste. Most people, when they try and describe a pawpaw fruit, they say it tastes like a cross between banana and mango, or sometimes they'll say banana and mango and pineapple, or banana, mango, cantaloupe. It's a very tropical fruit flavor, though. The texture is very soft and pudding-like, uh, which is why the, the whole family is called the custard apple family. Pawpaw is a natural understory tree. It will grow and fruit even in fairly heavy shade. If you open the fruit up, you'll see large brown seeds. Um, the seeds are inedible, as is the skin, um, but the, the yellow or orangish flesh is the, the edible pulp part of the tree. Because it can grow as an understory tree, it can be planted underneath the canopy of larger crop trees, such as nut trees, and that, I'll talk about, about that more later. Okay. Here's what the trees look like growing in shade as an understory tree. Uh, one's a late summer picture, and the other is uh, early fall. Asian pears, another tree on my list. Uh, they can be grown similar to apples, but they have some big advantages over apples. Uh, uh, a 
Asian pears can be grown without any kind of spray successfully, although you can get higher quality fruit with some moderate amount of spraying, unlike apples, which require uh, weekly spraying plus after every rainfall. They also require just a fraction of the pruning that apples take. Uh, I spend, on average, about one hour on each of my dwarf apple trees for pruning each year. It takes me about five to ten minutes to prune a standard pear tree. The best thing about Asian pears is the price they bring, though. Uh, Asian pears are priced by the fruit instead of by the pound. I haven't been uh, following the prices of apples lately, but the last time I did, wholesale prices for apples were ranging between 17 and 19 cents a pound wholesale. Uh, Asian pears usually range between a dollar fifty per fruit uh, to 450 or even higher than four dollars and fifty cents per fruit. So you can grow a whole lot fewer of them and still be successful. Um, the one area where Asian pears are more labor intensive than apples is in thinning. Uh, the trees tend to be overproductive, and so the fruit has to be thinned. Uh, in this picture here, you can see a, uh, a single fruiting spur with uh, looks like three fruits on it. Uh, without thinning, each spur will tend to try and produce anywhere from 10 to 15 fruits per spur. And when the spurs are located just a few inches apart among, along the branch, that means more than 90% of the fruit needs to be thinned in order to maintain good fruit size. But compared to the, all of the other disadvantages of apples, it, it makes Asian pears a lot more desirable crop to grow compared to apples. And the next plant on my list is honeyberries. And I have to admit right up front, I don't have a whole lot of experience with honeyberries. This is kind of a new crop. I did plant honeyberries 25 years ago, but they were just wild type bushes with tiny fruit. And uh, although they tasted really good, they were just too small to really bother with. So I kind of neglected them and let them die off. But there's some, some, been some big advances in honeyberry breeding in the last five to ten years. And there are now honeyberries that produce uh, quite large berries, very productive, delicious flavor, like a cross between a black raspberry and a blueberry. And uh, I think these are going to uh, turn out to be a very profitable berry crop to grow. The next tree on my list is the real star, the low-hanging fruit, as I like to say, and that's chestnuts. And when I say chestnut, I'm talking specifically about Chinese chestnuts, which is really the only uh, species of chestnut that is viable in our part of the world to grow commercially. Chestnuts have a very large market. In fact, they are the number three nut crop in the world behind only coconuts and peanuts and ahead of all types of walnuts plus almonds combined in terms of demand. And it seems like Americans are just about the only people in the world who don't know how important chestnuts are. Uh, they bring excellent prices. They're heavy bearing, very reliable bearing compared to other nut crops. Most nut crops tend to be alternate bearing, meaning they'll produce a good crop one year and then uh, skip the next year entirely or have a small crop the following year. Sometimes they'll skip a couple of years before they have a, another good crop. Chestnuts tend to have, produce a full crop every year unless there's some kind of dramatic, unusual weather event that produces the crop a particular year. <coughs> Uh, the Chinese chestnut has kind of a low, bushy growth form, uh, which will require pruning in, if you want to be able to get underneath the tree from close mowing. Uh, an alternative to 
That is to grow the trees in a five-foot-tall tree shelter, which keeps them from producing any limbs until they grow out the top of the five-foot shelter, which is high enough to get under it. With If you want to, if, or if you don't want to do your own marketing of chestnuts, there are at least four different chestnut growers cooperatives in North America right now, and uh, probably more will be coming, coming along soon in, in addition. Uh, there's one in Michigan, there's one in Ohio, there's one in uh, South Georgia and North Florida, and there's one for Iowa, Missouri, Illinois, and uh, if there were any growers in Wisconsin, Minnesota, South Dakota, Nebraska, Kansas, who wanted to sell through that the Prairie Grove Chestnut Growers Cooperative, they would be welcome to bring their nuts there too. Here you can see the prices paid for chestnuts last fall by Prairie Grove Chestnut Growers Cooperative. Uh, the smallest size, which make up a pretty small percentage of the harvest, was $1.30 a pound, which doesn't sound like a whole lot, and it's not, but look at the next size up. The medium size is more than twice the price of small. 270 a pound is what growers got who brought medium sized nuts into the cooperative. That was a higher price than large and even extra large size nuts. And this is in sharp contrast to what uh, most of the uh, authorities or experts will tell you about chestnut prices. They'll claim that the larger the size, the more valuable. We have found in Iowa that that is not the case. By far the most popular nut size is medium. And on a worldwide scale, that's also true. The, the Chinese, who were the number one producers of chestnuts in the world, uh, produce medium size, or prefer medium sized nuts over large and extra large size nuts. And they will pay a premium for medium sized nuts. On the other hand, if you don't want to sell your nuts through a cooperative, you can sell them on your own, either on-farm stands, farmer's markets, or you could sell direct to grocery stores. But what we have found is the best way to sell chestnuts is uh, directly to the customers who come and pick their own. We have customers coming to Redfern Farm literally from hundreds of miles away for the privilege of picking chestnuts from the ground, and they're happy to do it. We're located in southeast Iowa, but we have customers <coughs> driving from as far away as Minneapolis, Chicago, St. Louis, Kansas City, Omaha, Sioux City, Iowa, and Fargo, North Dakota. Two year, or no, three years ago, we had a family drive all the way up from South Florida, more than 1,200 miles, one way, just to pick chestnuts. Now they were visiting relatives in Iowa, but I think the, the visit to the relatives was more of an excuse to come pick chestnuts in this case. We get 250 a pound uh, when customers come and pick their own from the ground, uh, assuming they, pick, they take all they pick. Uh, very occasionally we'll have customers who want to sort out the large and extra large size nuts and only take the medium size, and in that case we'll charge uh, a higher price for the nuts they take and then pay them 50 cents a pound for the nuts they picked and left behind with us. But we haven't had that happen in a couple of years now. So we have a crop here that produces $10,000 per acre in income and we don't even have to harvest the crop. The customers do all the picking. We have a customer list with more than 230 names on it at this time, and we have the capacity to serve about 25 to 30 of those names per year. So there's a very huge unmet demand for you pick chestnuts in the Midwest. Most of our customers are either Bosnian, Korean, or Chinese, but we also have customers uh, from Croatia, Serbia, uh, Greece, 
Hungary, Poland, Germany, Czechoslovakia, France, uh, Japan, and probably several other countries that don't come to mind right now. The worst customers we have are Anglo-Americans. Anglo-Americans tend to buy one pound of chestnuts at Christmas time, whereas our typical Bosnian customers will take anywhere from oh, 100 to 600 pounds in one day. I would much rather make one sale of five or 600 pounds of chestnuts to a single Bosnian customer than 500 individual sales to American customers. Uh, chestnuts are enclosed in a very prickly, very sharp, spiny burr, which makes them absolutely varmint-proof. Uh, up until the moment the, the burr splits open and the nuts fall to the ground. Uh, then there's a free-for-all, and it's whoever gets there first gets the nut. The squirrels are the day crew, deer and raccoons are the night crew. We try and time harvest, schedule customers come to pick nuts in mid-afternoon so that they're finishing right around sunset if possible, and that leaves very little on the ground at night for the deer and raccoons. And then while, while there are people picking up nuts during the daytime, it, it kind of keeps the squirrels away from them. Uh, here are some recommended cultivar chestnuts for zone 5B and farther south. Um, Ching, Peach, Gideon, Moss, Barger, Auburn Super, Redfern Super, and Shotgun are two trees that originated at Redfern Farm that we really like that produce large, high-quality nuts, heavy-bearing. <coughs> uh, the others are uh, commercially available cultivars. If you're a little bit farther north than Zone 5B, um, here are some you could grow in 4B to 5A. Mossbarger, again, probably the single most cold-hardy pure Chinese chestnut. Uh, Luval's Monster is <coughs> an American hybrid, as are Badger Ching, Giant Badger, and Large Badger. Um, American chestnuts are a little bit more cold-hardy than Chinese when American and Chinese are crossed with each other, um, the result can produce uh, cold hardy, blight resistant trees that produce a, a nut large enough for commercial markets. Chestnuts to avoid. If you're in the Midwest or anywhere in the continental U.S., all Japanese and European and Japanese European hybrids and at most especially the variety Colossal, which is uh, being grown in Michigan and also on the West Coast. If you are in a Mediterranean climate, such as coastal California, coastal Oregon, coastal Washington, the Japanese and European chestnuts would be viable, but in the Midwest they are not um, for several reasons. Um, one is they just aren't adapted to our, our weather. When you try and grow Japanese and European hybrids uh, or in the Midwest where we get rainfall during the growing season, the nuts uh, tend to rot on the tree. Um, in fact, in Michigan where they're trying to grow colossals commercially, they recommend growers acquire a CAT scan machine and run all their nuts through this CAT scan machine. With the CAT scan machine, they can get the nuts up to 94% sound nuts, but that still leaves 6% rotten nuts, which is three times higher than what would be allowed at Prairie Grove Nut Growers Cooperative. So for that reason, if you're growing Japanese or European chestnuts, you cannot sell them to Prairie Grove Nut Growers Cooperative. They will not accept them because they are too poor in quality. Another one to avoid are the Dunstan hybrids. Uh, unless you're in zone 6B or farther south, uh, Dunstan hybrids 
are only marginally hardy in zone 6A, and they are totally unsuited to anywhere in zone 5 or farther north. They are being sold this far north, but uh, I get calls, many, many calls every year from people saying they bought Dunstan hybrid chestnuts from Tyson's or Farm and Fleet, and they did fine for a couple of years, and then had a cold winter, and they all died. Um, the Dunstan hybrids were developed in Florida, and they have Florida cold hardiness. Don't plant them in zone five. Anything from one of the slick, glossy nursery catalogs, um, I'm not going to name any names here, but uh, I think most of you know who I'm talking about. But uh, those companies tend to uh, search hard to find the tiniest nuts they can find to grow their nursery stock. That's because tiny sized nuts are a lot cheaper and they'll give them more seedlings per pound that they purchase. But what those grow into are trees that produce tiny nuts which have little or no commercial value. Also, you should avoid any field-grown bare root chestnuts. Uh, many trees can be grown in the field and dug up bare root and will survive and recover from that kind of treatment, but chestnuts are not in that group. Um, I have spent literally thousands of dollars on uh, bare root chestnuts, and I do not have one single tree surviving to show for it. If they're grown in a really light, sandy soil, uh, a field-grown chestnut will probably do okay, but if they're grown in anything like a loam soil or heavier, uh, chestnuts just do not survive being um, field-grown and bare-rooted. Here's what chestnuts look like on the ground at harvest time. You can see the, the burrs split open and drop the nuts to the ground. Chestnut harvesting is hard work. Some of the things we've tried over the years include bag of nut, a device that rolls over the nuts, <coughs> picks them up, and drops them in a basket. Um, the bag of nut works really well on round nuts like pecans and hazels and walnuts, and, but it does not work very well on chestnuts, which tend to have one or two flat sides, so they hug the ground a little tighter. So I found that the bag of nut was about 60% efficient at picking up chestnuts. Not near enough. Here's a large size bag of nut um, being pulled in front of a mower. Another thing we tried was a lawn sweeper. It turned out the lawn sweeper was very good at picking up chestnut burrs, but uh, not very good at all at picking up chestnuts. So we ended up using a, the lawn sweeper to go over the ground <coughs> to get the burrs out of the way about halfway through the harvest season make it easier to pick up the nuts, but they didn't. it did not work for picking up nuts very well. What does work really well for chestnut harvest is a tool called a nut wizard. And by happy coincidence, it's also the least expensive tool. These are about 10 times faster than hand picking. Even a skinny little girl can use a nut wizard. Now that we do all of our harvesting strictly by UPIC customers, we actually ha have a fleet of nut wizards that we loan out to the customers uh, for their use. They pay for themselves many times over. Another thing we tried that didn't work was uh, uh, commercial motorized uh, pecan harvesting machinery. That also was only about 60% efficient. Right now there is available a machine uh, called a FACMA chestnut harvester that is made specifically for harvesting chestnuts and it is more efficient <coughs> than a pecan harvester. But after talking to the salesman, I calculated that five people with nut wizards could stay ahead of this $200,000 machine. And the nut wizards only use two drops of oil per year and make almost no noise. They don't use any fuel. 
and cost about $55 a piece. I'm going to talk very briefly about what it takes to get chestnuts established. Uh, the single most important tool in getting chestnuts established is a five foot tall ventilated tree shelter. Now, uh, this is actually not the brand that you prefer, but uh, this company called Plantra makes a very well ventilated tree shelter, very economical. And the tree shelters do a number of things. They reduce tree mortality dramatically. They make the trees grow faster and make them start producing nuts in two to four years, whereas without a tree shelter, the chestnuts take six to ten years to, before they produce their first nuts. It protects the trees from deer and rabbits, and it also eliminates the need for pruning. If you remember the growth form of the chestnut, that bushy form there, that's the way they'll grow if you don't grow them in a tree shelter. With the tree shelter, it keeps the trunk clear up to five feet high, which is how high you need to get under it with a mower. You have to get under a chestnut tree with a mower to keep the grass short because you cannot harvest chestnuts from grass. With the tree shelter, uh, it eliminates all the pruning. Without the tree shelter, you, have, you should count on having to prune every single chestnut tree every year for anywhere from 10 to 15 years before you get a clear trunk five feet high. And you will produce a mountain of prunings on each acre every year for 10 to 15 years before you achieve that five foot clear trunk. The tree shelters do it automatically. Besides protecting the tree from deer and rabbits and making it grow faster, and uh, another thing that is extremely important to getting the chestnut trees established is weed control. And I found that the herbicide, the sulfometeron methyl, or oust is the trade name, herbicide is extremely effective. It provides a whole year of weed control at a very low rate of uh, one ounce of granular per acre, and that's per full acre of treatment. If you have a chestnut tree planting at 20 by 20 spacing and you're treating a three foot diameter circle around the base of each tree, uh, you only need about 1 60th of an ounce of oust for an acre of tree planting like that. Or another way of looking at it is a piece of oust about the size of a grain of salt will keep a three foot diameter circle around the base of a tree weed free for a year without damaging the soil the way some other herbicides do. Uh, without weed control, it is extremely difficult to get chestnut trees established. This is the cheap, easy way to do it. Another way to do weed control would be to put a three foot diameter or three foot square of landscape fabric down around the base of each tree and top it with two to three inches of coarse wood chips. And that works, but you can count on it costing probably an additional $1,000 per acre in establishment cost. The oust herbicide treatment costs about 30 cents per acre. The landscape fabric staples and mulch about $1,000 an acre. You can plant a lot of trees for the cost of landscape fabric and mulch. <clears throat> okay, now I'm going to talk a, a little bit about a, a few things that have not worked out well as profitable tree crops. Aronia. Aronia is another Native American fruit, native to Iowa, native to the Midwest. <clears throat> uh, it's really easy to grow, very productive. Uh, the berries all come ripe close to the same time, <clears throat> unlike most other berries that have to be picked every day or every other day for weeks at a time. You can wait until all the aronia berries are ripe and then pick them just once. <coughs> <clears throat> you can pick them into a five-gallon bucket 
and the ones at the bottom won't squish. You can leave the bucket sitting out in 95 degree heat for a week and they don't spoil. They're just about idiot proof as far as growing. The one thing they don't do is taste good. Uh, almost nobody claims to like aronia berries. And what that means is they have to be processed into something. And because of that, um, it lowers their value. And right now, people can buy a container load, container ship load of aronia berries for 50 cents a pound on the world market. And as long as that is true, um, it's going to be very difficult to grow aronias profitably. And it's very difficult even to harvest them for much less than 50 cents a pound. <coughs> Uh, there was a North American uh, Aronia Growers Cooperative that formed a few years ago. Uh, it went bankrupt and out of business. <laughs> there are probably hundreds if not thousands of Aronia berry acres being taken out right now because they just are not working out as a commercial crop. I don't recommend them. <laughs> Another thing that's not really working out as a commercial crop in the Midwest is hazelnuts. Uh, for some of the same reasons that aronias aren't working, uh, <coughs> the kind of hazels we can grow in the Midwest are bush type hazel right now that hangs on the bush, has to be picked from the bush by machine instead of falling free from the husk like the uh, commercial hazelnuts grown in Oregon do. So they have to be picked by machine and then husked by machine and sorted by machine <clears throat> and then cracked by machine and then the, the hazel shells and kernels separated by machine before you have a, a commercial product you can sell. And then <clears throat> once you have hazel kernels ready to sell, you can get about 60 cents a pound for them. Uh, there is an, a, a hazelnut growers cooperative, a Midwest hazel growers cooperative. They say their break-even price on hazelnuts is $4 a pound. But as long as you can buy hazels for 60 cents a pound on the world market, it's going to be very hard to sell hazelnuts grown in the Midwest at a profit. Someday we may have hazelnuts that uh, drop free from the husk to the ground in a tree form, like the way the Oregon hazels grow. We're probably at least 10 years away from having a group of cultivars that can do that. And until then, we're stuck with the, the bush hazels that we have available right now. <coughs> But when that day comes, when we do have hazelnuts we can grow in the Midwest at a profit, at best they will be about one-tenth as profitable as chestnuts per acre. And we're nowhere near that yet. Nobody has made any money on hazels in the Midwest. People have been trying it for 40 years and nobody's succeeded yet. Here's a list of some uh, helpful organizations and links. And I guess at this point I'll open it up to questions. Hi, thanks so much, Tom. Um, that was some great information. I'm going to switch it over to the question and answer. Let me go ahead and get started with the questions. Hi, hey, go ahead. Uh, this is actually Liz calling from Indiana, and oh. um, <laughs> um, hey, um, my question was: I'm intrigued by the Plantra five foot tall ventilated tree tubes, um, and I'm curious if you recommend those just specifically for chestnuts, or if those you use those for other trees as well. I started using the Plantra 
three shelters on Chester. <laughs> About 10 years ago, I was using them just on Chester for a few years, but lately I've been using them on both pears uh, persimmon. And I find, I'm finding that they're working every bit as well on those on the chestnuts. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you so much. Um, we've got a question from Renee here. Um, Renee asked, would you alley crop the honeyberries and understory the pawpaws in a chestnut orchard? Um, yes, absolutely. That is exactly what I'm doing right now. I'm planting honeyberries in between rows of chestnut and pawpaw. Oh, and I, and I should have pointed out earlier, and I forgot, uh, I, I put a, a pawpaw tree under every chestnut tree as an understory tree. So uh, the pawpaws don't take anything away from the chestnuts, but... Uh, add an additional crop to the same acre at the same time. And we can do the same thing with honeyberries and uh, even put things like ginseng and golden seal on the ground underneath even the honeyberries for even more additional crops on the same acre at the same time. Um, oh, we've got another question for Brad. Uh, where do you recommend sourcing the chestnut varieties you mentioned um, to plant our own orchards? Yeah. One thing I didn't is that actually Chinese chestnut is one crop where actually seedlings are better than grafted trees. When I was talking about cultivar chestnuts, I was actually talking about uh, seedlings of those cultivars rather than the cultivars themselves. We do have a nursery and we, we sell seedlings of all those cultivars that I mentioned. Um, Unfortunately, there aren't a whole lot of sources of, for those. I do know of one source in Oklahoma and one in Ohio that also sells uh, seedlings of superior uh, cultivar chestnuts, but uh, Redfern Farm is one, one source of uh, high-quality, commercial-quality chestnut nursery stock for the Midwest, anyway. Thanks, Tom. Next question is from Emily, and she's asking... And Brad said thanks, by the way, too. Um, and Emily asks, what are your spacing recommendations for the chestnut, pawpaw, and honeyberry trio? The what recommendations? Um, the spacing recommendations. Oh, spacing. Okay. Well, that's a whole day's worth of discussion. But the short answer is I recommend a 20 by 20 spacing between chestnuts. And then I put a pawpaw in between each pair of chestnuts. So there'll be a tree every 10 feet alternating between chestnut and pawpaw. And then uh, 20 feet in between rows, and then I'll put a row of honeyberries in between the rows of chestnut and pawpaw. So a row every 10 feet, and then a tree every 10 feet, but alternating between chestnut, pawpaw, and honeyberry. Oh, great. Thank you. Renee asked, how about water irrigation for chestnut production? And how much and when? Yes. Oh, and Renee. What about fertilizer? Um, you can get by without irrigation of chestnuts, but it would be to your benefit to irrigate them because uh, the chestnut nut puts on 60% of its uh, nut weight in the last two weeks before the nuts ripen and fall from the tree, and virtually 100% of that, 60% in the last two weeks, is water. So they take they need moist soil at the time they're ripening in order to the, for the nuts to fully size up. Uh, and this is happening in um, mid-September to mid-October. If you think about it, that's usually the driest time of the year when the soil's the driest. So if you can provide irrigation during that one-month period from mid-September to mid-October, the nuts will fully size up and, uh, in fact, it can make a a difference of 100% or more in the size of the crop. Uh, then again, um, the next year's crop is determined to a large extent um, by the soil moisture at the time the trees are going dormant, which is um, <clears throat> mid-October or later. So if you can provide irrigation from mid-September to the end of October, just for that time period, uh, the trees will do a lot better. 
Um, as far as irrigation, again, you can get by without irrigating. Um, in Iowa, on Iowa soils, we can produce 2,000 pounds per acre of chestnuts without any irrigation or fertilization um, by year 12. It takes growers in places like Ohio 30 years to get 2,000 pounds uh, per acre of production, and that's with lots of fertilizer. But that said, with fertilizer, I think um, the chestnut production could be significantly increased. In, in fact, I think uh, uh, most chestnut growers in North America don't think we can do better than about 2,000 pounds per acre. But I know from experience that on our Iowa soils, um, we can push 5,000 pounds per acre with fertilizer and irrigation. Um, Renee says, thanks, Tom. And Emily also thanked you and said that this has been really helpful. Tom, do you have less soils where you are? Do I have a what? Do you have less soils where you are? Um, oh, less? So, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Our soils are okay. uh, silt loam uh, formed in lush with about 11 feet of lush overlaying glacial till oh, wow. in our location. You've got some great soils there. Yes, we do. We, have, we actually have uh, the very best temperate hardwood growing soils in the world right here. Yeah, I believe it. <laughs> in fact, our lo at our location is one of the uh, the only locations on the planet Earth that where white oak trees will grow as a fast-growing tree. Oh, and, wow. Uh, Happy coincidence, the, the site preferences for chestnut and white oak are just about identical. Um, so Cody's asking, would a honeyberry perform well in a warmer zone like seven? Well, I have to admit, I don't even know how well they're going to perform here. Uh, they're native in colder zones like uh, three and four. Uh, I do know of people growing them in uh, Zone 7, even Zone 8, as far south as Arkansas. But I don't know how well they will do commercially. And actually, nobody, nobody really does because they're just too new of a crop. Uh, but we suspect they'll at least be commercially viable through Zone 5. And Cody says thank you. Um, I was curious, Tom, uh, I, I don't know if I missed it at the very beginning when you were talking about heart nuts. Um, how hard are they to crack? Are they are they one of the nuts that are really difficult to crack? Um, <clears throat> well, you you can't crack them in your fingers like you can with peanuts, um, and they are a little bit harder to crack. I mean, the shells are a little bit thicker than a, a Persian walnut or what Americans call an English walnut. Uh, but <clears throat> if you apply pressure across the shoulders of the heart, the uh, at least on a good heart nut, the, the shell will pop in two, in, in two halves, releasing the kernel whole and unbroken. It's the only uh, walnut in the world that releases a whole unbroken kernel, in fact. Uh, oh, wow. it, it does take a special nutcracker to crack them, but, um, but they're much easier to crack than a black walnut, for example. The other question I had uh, was, how do you, are there any um, trees that you mentioned or crops that you mentioned that you want to avoid planting near each other? Because I know there's problems with um, black walnuts, for example. They don't play well with other, with a lot of other plants. Are, are there issues? Yeah, well, of, of the trees that I discussed, I think honeyberries and Asian pears would not work well with black walnuts. Do they all... Um, um, but, Otherwise, but, do they all but, work well together? Yeah, the honeyberry uh, and all uh, the chestnut, other Yeah, chestnut, persimmon, pawpaw uh, can all be planted around black walnuts and each other. And, and in fact, oh. um, um, persimmon and walnuts work well together for some reason. Per, uh, persimmons actually prefer to be planted around walnuts. Mark has a question. Um, how did you do marketing to attract the large buyers of chestnuts you mentioned? Um, we do no marketing whatsoever. Our, our marketing is strictly by word of mouth among our customers. We don't, we don't advertise. We don't need to advertise. In fact, uh, um, we only started doing the, the UPIC on chestnuts about four years ago. And at that time, uh, I was very reluctant to do it, but we had, we had a, a Bosnian family that literally begged us 
to let them pick their own because it was what they'd done in the old country. Uh, I was afraid our insurance wouldn't cover it, and I was afraid of liability, but I didn't want to disappoint them, so I told them, okay, go ahead, but don't tell anybody. <laughs> and within about two days, we had a list of 20-some people who wanted to do it. <clears throat> and the next year, it was 70-some. And this year, we're, 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 right now, we're up to 230 names on the waiting list. And most of those people know that um, it, it may be years before they get a call, and they're willing to wait. And we oh, we wow. even uh, we even send customers to nearby chestnut farms because we know that it would be years before we could handle them. And uh, everybody who's tried it so far has, has loved you pick. It, it eliminates harvesting cost, <coughs> sanitation cost, refrigeration cost, packaging cost, shipping cost. And uh, advertising and marketing costs. And when you eliminate all those costs, the only thing left is profit. That's why we can make, on our mature trees, $10,000 an acre on a crop we don't have to harvest. Wow, that's amazing. Yes, it is. So they just knew to contact you, sold chestnuts? Because you, you sell chestnuts or that you advertise chestnuts, and so they just contacted you kind of out of the blue? Yeah, somehow, just about as the time our first trees started producing nuts, people started finding out, and uh, all you have to do is let one person within a, an ethnic community where they like chestnuts know about, know you have them, and the word spreads like a, uh, like a prairie fire in a high wind. Right. Wow. We've never had to do any advertising. Oh, in fact, we, we ration yeah. chestnuts instead of marketing them. <laughs> wow, crazy. Um, and and Renee, that's pretty much always been the case for us. Uh, Renee asks, can Asian pears be alley cropped with chestnuts? Um, <clears throat> yes, but... Not like honeyberries. They they have to have their own space because uh, the Asian pears will get to be a size similar to the chestnut trees. So you can't put them underneath the chestnuts like you can with pawpaws and honeyberries. But you can grow them in the same vicinity. Okay. Thank you. Um, and Franco is asking, uh, any honeyberry varieties recommended, or are there varieties to stay away from for honeyberries? Um, yes. Um, <clears throat> as I said, there have been a lot of big advances in honeyberry breeding, and, and I should probably point out, too, that uh, the honeyberries also go under the name Hascap, which is a Japanese name for the fruit. And if you were marketing to Japan, that would be a good name to use. Uh, but in English, Hascap sounds like the name to a special, can, the lid to a special container for transporting hazmat or toxic waste. Um, <laughs> right. it, it, whereas honeyberry sounds like something that would taste good. Um, the ones I would recommend right now would include uh, the Boreal series from the University of Saskatchewan, the Boreal Beast, Boreal Blizzard, and Boreal Beauty. Um, also, uh, Tundra, which is a slightly older version, but uh, these berries are about twice the size of what used to be considered a, a large size honeyberry just five years ago, and it makes the older ones uh, pretty much obsolete. Uh, so the, the, the berries from University of Saskatchewan under the, the Indigo series are, I would consider, obsolete now, uh, and I would go with the later, the boreal series as a top pick. There's also a company in uh, Arkansas that has uh, developed their own honeyberry lines. I don't know how good those are. I have some, but it'll be a couple of years before I can uh, assess their quality. But right now, the, the boreal series would be the, my top picks for honeyberries. Great, thank you. Um, and do you have to, Cody asks, do you have to deal with 
worms in your chestnut? Um, I'm assuming he means weevil larva. Uh, there are no chestnut uh, weevils in Iowa at this time, and we hope to keep it that way for as long as possible. I expect someday we will have chestnut weevils, but right now we do not have them. And we also do not have chestnut gall wasp in Iowa. So we're, we're in kind of a sweet spot right now for chestnut production. Cody says that must be nice. You can't even imagine. <laughs> now, chestnut weevil is a, a serious pest in areas where they are endemic. And, um, in, <clears throat> in fact, that's probably the single worst pest. And they, um, the American consumers have a zero tolerance for little white grubs in their food. So if you have yeah. chestnut weevil, you have to do something to control them or you cannot market your chestnuts. And there are two species of chestnut weevil. There's a greater chestnut weevil and a lesser chestnut weevil. And <clears throat> one of them has a two-year life cycle. The other has a, a one-year life cycle. And this creates a unique situation where uh, the worst pest is actually the lesser of two weevils. Uh, would, would control be through pesticides or post-harvest treatment? <clears throat> yeah. Well... Yeah, I don't have that problem, but I do know I do know people who use uh, insecticides to control weevils, and I know other people who <coughs> use a post-harvest treatment where they uh, soak the nuts in a hot water bath of uh, precisely 120 degrees Fahrenheit for precisely 20 minutes, which uh, kills the weevil larva and makes them immediately dissolve and disappear. Does that wreck the nut? Boiling the uh... no, no. It, not spoiled enough. The nuts are, are marketable. Even if they had larvae in them, they're still marketable if, the, uh, if they're given the hot water bath. Okay. Thank you. Cody says thank you as well. Um, Matt included a link for, from the Center of um, Agroforestry about the weevil. So I'll include that in any in follow-up email that I send out as well. Or if you're on your computer, you can and click the chat thing and, and click on the link. And I, I guess it's a good resource for treating weevils with hot water bath method. Matt also says that there's a great set of videos that Empire Chestnut about that on YouTube. Yep, Empire Chestnut is the, the pioneer of the hot water bath for weevil treatment. Um, Mark asks, do you have any recommendations for pest um, or weed control that are approved by organic systems? Well, I'm a bit of a contrarian in that respect. But, well, uh, I believe that you should do absolutely whatever it takes to get the trees established, in, including using herbicides. Uh, and then once the trees are established, then you can go through the, the three-year withdrawal period and get certified organic. But if you don't want to do that, as I mentioned before, uh, an alternative uh, weed control method that doesn't involve herbicide would be to use a square of landscape fabric <laughs> stapled down around the base of each tree and topped with two to three inches of coarse wood chips. And it would take nine staples around the perimeter of, the, of each piece of landscape fabric. If you don't use nine staples, you'll get, it, get the edge of the fabric caught in a mower. Um, but this does work, and it is an acceptable organic weed control method, but it is very expensive and very labor intensive compared to the herbicide treatment. If you use that method, does it make it hard to pick up the nuts? Well, you, you only need the, the landscape fabric and mulch or herbicide for oh, a period of a few years just to get the tree established. <laughs> um, and during that period, the, the tree's not producing any uh, significant uh, amount of nuts yet. Oh, so that's okay. not an issue. So the weed control is important during the establishment phase, and that's pre-nut production. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, and that, that another reason not to worry about whether the weed control is approved for organic is because you're not selling any organic product during the time the tree is being established anyway. Ah, Mark says thanks as well. 
And Matt provided another YouTube link. Here we go. Matt has a question. question. Or maybe Liz. Oh, okay. Hey Tom, uh, Matt Wilson here. Um, just following up on the the weevil issue because we definitely have it in Kentucky where I am. How viable do you think it would be to do a U pick where people then you know bag their chestnuts in some kind of a um, you know like a um, net bag and then do a hot water bath right there on site. I mean, you know what people are looking for when they're doing you, you pick. Do you think that would be a viable business option where, where they sit around for 20 minutes while their chestnuts get, you know, heated up? Or is that, would that just make things too complicated? Oh, if you had the right equipment. If you had the, oh, the method of the temperature very precisely. Uh, I, I think that, and I, I don't think uh, the customers would have a problem waiting around for an extra 20 minutes. Our, our customers tend to like to stay all day, and uh, and then talk about chestnuts at the end of the day. For, uh, they'll typically hang around for half hour to an hour after we've got the their nuts weighed out and bagged and uh, loaded in their vehicle. And there was a question about persimmon spacing. That's right. Uh, uh, in my personal opinion, I, I like to keep the persimmon trees kind of on the small side so that the, uh, the fruit doesn't fall very far to the ground because the fruit is very soft, extremely soft. Uh, when it's ripe, and if it's falling very far f to the ground, it can go splat when it hits the ground. So I like to keep the trees down low, <coughs> which means keeping the trees small by pruning. And it's not hard to do on a persimmon tree. Unlike an apple tree, um, the persimmons take very little pruning and, and can be kept small with a minimal amount of pruning. And so that for that reason... I would say um, 20 by 20 spacing for persimmons. Matt asks, uh, do you use straw under the persimmons to catch the fruit? Uh, no, I don't. I'm, I was, I'm actually, I have plans to build a, a device that I can roll under the chestnut tree that would have, that would catch the fruit in a tarp. Uh, but... <clears throat> I just haven't actually done that yet. I do have plans to put straw under pop, pawpaw trees to catch and cushion the fruit fall, but not for persimmons. Uh, Cody asks, are you growing oriental persimmons or just American? I, I grow strictly American persimmons. The oriental persimmons are not cold hardy here. In fact, their uh, oriental persimmons are even uh, marginal uh, two zones to the south of us. Uh, I, I must admit, I do have a great wall persimmon, which is uh, a khaki persimmon, uh, one brought over by J. Russell Smith, but it's mainly a novelty, and I keep it in a pot and bring it indoors during the winter. Uh, Jared asks, after chestnuts, what have you found is the most in demand by your customers? Um, Pawpaws are, uh, are definitely second place after chestnuts, and we sell probably three-quarters of our pawpaws to UPIC customers. And we do have UPIC customers coming from as far away as 350 miles to pick pawpaws. Um, we don't have any customers who are that excited about persimmons or Asian pears or any bays or any, anything else, but the chestnuts are by far our most important crop, uh, but pawpaws are definitely second place. I think the, the pawpaws add a, a, around 2500 to $300, or three, $2,500 to $3,000 an acre uh, to, the, to what the chestnuts produce. Do pawpaws grow true from seed? I wouldn't. 
exactly say pawpaws grow true from seed, but um, pawpaw is another crop. Um, pawpaw and chestnut together are uh, the only t two tree crops I know of where seedlings are actually better to grow than grafted trees. Um, the chestnuts are are because grafted chestnuts tend to grow as a dwarf tree uh, and have a very high rate of graft union failure. So a, if you plant an acre of grafted chestnuts and an acre of seedling chestnuts next to them, the seedling chestnuts will produce five to six times more nuts uh, than the grafted trees. In the case of the pawpaws, any pawpaw tree trunk will have a lifespan of about 15 years, about like a dwarf apple tree. At the end of that 15 years, that trunk is going to die, and the root system will send up a bunch of suckers. Uh, so if you plant a grafted pawpaw tree, you're going to get about 15 years out of it, and unless you take cyan wood off the tree before it dies and graft it onto its own suckers, you lose that tree at the end of 15 years. <coughs> If you plant uh, uh, seedlings from superior pawpaw cultivars, uh, a, a good portion of the seedlings of pawpaws, even though they aren't true from seed, sometimes they'll even be better than the parents. And uh, I have one particular uh, a cross between two superior pawpaw cultivars that I, I refer to as shensus. Uh, that produces about 75% seedlings that are uh, commercial quality. And those seedlings, <coughs> uh, even though they, it, it, the original trunk will only last about 15 years, when those original trunks die and they send up a bunch of suckers from the root system, uh, every one of those suckers will grow into a tree just as good as the original tree. So if you plant shensa seedlings, plant a, an orchard full of shensa seedlings, even if you only have to remove a quarter of the trees, everything left after that will be commercial quality superior trees that will last forever, uh, at, at least hundreds of years, if not longer, and just keep growing and expanding. Uh, whereas if you plant just a grafted tree, or uh, like I said, if you don't... Uh, collect like cyan wood and graft the suckers before that original tree dies, that you're only going to get 15 years out of it. Um, Jared asks, which of the trees are hardest to get established? Well, if you do things right, if you plant them on a good site, put them in a, in a tree shelter, a two-foot tree shelter for pawpaws, a five-foot tree shelter for everything else, uh, and do good weed control, uh, all of these trees are fairly easy to establish. But if you m neglect any of those necessities, uh, it can be very difficult to establish trees. I'd say the pawpaws are probably the most delicate. Uh, they actually require partial shade to get established. They can grow in full sun once they get to be two feet tall or so, but uh, when they're under two feet tall, direct sun can kill them. Uh, but if you plant pawpaws in the shade of timber, they'll actually grow and thrive, which very few other trees can do. And Cody asks, do you recommend tree troops for the pawpaws? Yes, two-foot tree shelters for pawpaws. And then Matt asked, um, do you graft persimmons in the field, or do you transplant the grafted trees? Uh, I do both. I actually prefer planting uh, seedling persimmons in the field, letting them grow up to about four feet tall, and then graft them in place. But I do, uh, I do some bench grafting in the nursery, and then plant grafted trees in the field on occasion. Yeah. And Renee asks, which pawpaw varietal? flavor is most sought after? That's hard to say. <clears throat> um, I don't have any customers that um, seek out particular cultivars of pawpaw to eat. Um, but 
that said, I, I'd say some of the best flavored ones would include uh, Shenandoah and Susquehanna, but also NC1 and Overlease, and uh, uh, even the Pennsylvania Golden series are are very good flavored. Thanks. And uh, Cody has another question. He asks, can you still establish pawpaws in a new chestnut planting with full sun? Yes, the pawpaws can be planted uh, in a new chestnut planting where the chestnuts aren't casting much shade if you use two-foot tree shelters. The tree shelters provide just exactly the right amount of shade to the pawpaw until they get tall enough that they don't need the shelter anymore, which is about two feet. So the pawpaws can be added at any time from... Uh, uh, from before the chestnuts are planted to at the same time to any time after, even when the chestnuts are really big, you can still plant pawpaws under large chestnut trees. Cody says, great, thank you. Um, and then Matt had a clarifying question on establishing persimmon. Um, he's asking, are you saying that you're planting bare root one or two year old persimmons and then grafting? Um, not bare root. I'd, um, persimmons are another one of those trees that don't perform very well if they're field grown and, and dug up bare root. Uh, I grow them in pots, uh, special pots that uh, air prune the root system and prevent root spiraling. Um, so I, I, pot, or I plant potted persimmons into the field, let them get up about four feet tall, and then graft them. Okay, thank you. If there's no other questions right now. Um, I'd like to thank, well, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us. Um, this has been a great discussion, um, great question and answer period. Um, but I'd really like to thank you, Tom, uh, for joining us and sharing all your wisdom with us tonight. Um, I really appreciate it, and especially knowing that you had a pipe burst today. Um, thank you so much for, for being with us. Um, You're welcome. And I hope you all have a great night.